leery about that because we don't need a priesthood now. And we're going to see why we don't have a, a physical priesthood today in our churches as we look at Hebrews 7. But before we jump into the entire chapter, I do want to read what I think is a summary passage. And so we're going to read Hebrews 7 verses 26 through 28. And so once again, if you are able, would you please rise for the reading of God's word? So Hebrews chapter 27, starting in verse 26. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for your word, and we thank you for Christ, who is our greater prophet and who is our high priest who stands forever before you on our behalf. And Lord, as we look at this passage today, as we look at uh, this chapter and other parts of your word, we ask that uh, through your Holy Spirit, you would open our eyes and our hearts to, to see and hear and, and take in what you have for us so that we can um, be transformed and made more into the image of your Son who is blessed forever. And God, we ask that you would just continue to transform us and continue to strengthen us as a church to do the things that you've called us to, as we've heard about today so much about the hope and preparation of your coming. Help us to go out into the world to share with others around us um, that we have a priest who stands in our place, who intercedes for us and who wants to reconcile sinners to God. Lord, we love you and we praise you for all of these things that you have blessed us with and so much more. And it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. So like I said, this our Advent series. We're looking at the offices of Christ and the three offices that he holds and how they correspond to Old Testament officers and how those were the leaders of the people. So last week, as we said, we talked about the prophets and how the prophets were the, the mouthpieces of God, how they were responsible for showing forth and telling the people of God the word of God, and how Christ over uh, supersedes and is greater than Moses, who is the prophet. The other leader, the other officer that we're going to look at, as we've said, is the priest. Um, when we think about the, the, the prophet, the priest, and the king, the priest is something that can be kind of, a little tricky for us to wrap our minds around, but hopefully as we look at Hebrews 7, we'll get a clear, a clear understanding of who Christ is as a priest and why this is needed for us. So let's start in Hebrews 7 verses 1 through 3. The author says this, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, the king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. But resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. Now, this Melchizedek character, he's a really interesting guy. He's a really interesting character within the Old Testament. He really only appears uh, that I was able to find about twice. Once in Genesis 14, where we're about to go and, and look at his story, and then also in Psalm 110. But in Genesis 14, we see what is depicted in these first three verses that Abraham has gone out to war, and after he comes back from this war, this mysterious priestly character comes up to him 
and blesses him. So let's, let's read that story real quick in Genesis 14. We're going to read it in uh, verses 17 through 20. So Genesis 14, starting in verse 17. After his, that is Abraham or Abram, after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Now this is an interesting, an interesting little story because Melchizedek just pops in, does his thing, and then he disappears. And so that's why in this passage uh, in Hebrews 7, the author of Hebrews just says, he is without genealogy, he is without father or mother, he is without beginning of days nor end of life. He just pops into the story and pops out, and it's very mysterious. But there's a really good purpose for this, because as Abraham is being blessed by Melchizedek, if you noticed, he brings out bread and he brings out wine. And this Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem, the king of peace, the king of righteousness, he is blessed by Abraham. Now, this is what we would call a type, a type of Christ. If you're unfamiliar about the, the wording about what typology is, typology is a way of interpreting the Bible by taking real people, real events, real items and, and things, and viewing them in a way that points forward or foreshadows someone or something else later in salvation history. Okay, so for instance, last week we talked about Moses as the prophet who foreshadows or points to the coming of Christ, who is the greater prophet. Moses is considered a type of Christ. David, who is considered the ultimate king of Israel, is also considered a type of Christ along with his ancestor. You also have things like Paul talking about how earthly marriage now how it somehow points to this mystery of Christ and the, his bride, the church, in the future and how those two will be brought together. We have these types that point to a future reality. Okay, So Melchizedek is considered a type of Christ, especially here in Hebrews 7. So as a type of Christ, what we're going to see is that he blesses Abraham, and he is a priest without any sort of legal lineage under the Levitical law. And this is important in that he brings bread and wine, which if you can guess, points to communion or the Lord's Supper in some way. And all of this is going to foreshadow and point to Christ in his priestly ministry. So let's look now at starting back in verse 4 in Hebrews 7. So then the author says, see how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these are also descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of its ancestor when Melchizedek met him. So Melchizedek was a priest, a priest of God most high. But when we think about priests in the Old Testament, we think about typically the Levitical priesthood, those who were descended from Levi, those who were descended from the line of Aaron. But Melchizedek is something different, something greater. The author of Hebrews says that he is even greater than Abraham in some way. Now it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around because Abraham is the patriarch, the one who has the promises of the nation of Israel given to him. 
He is called a friend of God. Like Moses, he spoke with God face to face. Abraham is a really important character within salvation history. But Melchizedek is said to be even greater than him. Because as it says, the inferior, that who is the person who is lesser, is blessed by the person who is greater. So somehow, some way, Melchizedek is superior than Abraham. His order, therefore, the priestly order of Melchizedek, is superior to the Levitical priesthood. So we have these, this dichotomy or these two groups that are being set up within this passage. That we have Melchizedek and the priests who are sort of in his line, in his order. And then we have the Levitical priests, those who are descended from Levi and descended from Abraham. What we need to recognize is that as we talk about the need for priests, and we'll get down to this in a little bit, the need for priests, we need something that is greater than the priesthood that was given to us in the Levitical law. Melchizedek is the greater priest because Christ will inevitably be the greatest of the high priests. Now the Levites, as we talked about in this passage in in verse 5, they were given a command to do a lot of their priestly duties, to receive tithes, receive offerings, to sacrifice offerings. And the commandment was actually given to them to serve under the Mosaic law. So they have this this law that they are having to follow where they are only doing the right rituals as prescribed under the law, right? They're not able to just kind of freewheel, willy-nilly, do whatever they want and worship. They have a very specific set of parameters for what type of sacrifices and how they're supposed to offer these sacrifices. And as they were being made into priests in Numbers 3, they're told they're supposed to be protecting the priesthood at all cost. Anybody cannot worship God as these priests do under the Levitical law. In fact, if you or I, if we wanted to be a priest, if we wanted to offer sacrifices and we walked to the altar to sacrifice a lamb, they were under instruction to put us to death. It's important that they were protecting the priesthood of Levi. So we have this this conundrum that then comes up because if Christ is supposed to be this high priest, if Christ is supposed to be a priest on our behalf, he's not from the tribe of Levi, as we're about to see. So if Christ were to be a high priest, if Christ were to be a priest for us, cannot be one from Levi, from the tribe of Levi. So, let's look at verse 11 now. Where the author is going to talk about how there's a limited nature of the law and a limited nature of the priesthood. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek? rather than one named after the order of Aaron. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. So we're building this this interesting argument in this interesting case that the Levitical priesthood is limited and it's flawed in what it can do. The author of Hebrews says it cannot have perfection attained under it. So we have this limited Levitical priesthood and we have this Melchizedek who is this weird, mysterious figure who pops into this story and is said to be superior to Abraham and therefore superior to uh, to Levi. And so under the law, we have this inability for us in our weakness to obtain perfection. None of us can follow the law perfectly. None of the Levitical priests could follow the law perfectly. And so salvation, perfection, is unable to be grasped or unable to be obtained through this, which means we need something better, right? We have to have something that is better and that can help us get the perfection and get the salvation that we need. But it's interesting because Christ, as our priest, as Hebrews says, he did not come from the tribe of Levi. He came from Judah. And as we're going to look at next week, when we look at Christ the King, Judah was meant to hold the scepter. 
the, the rulers of Israel, the rulers of Judah, were supposed to come from the tribe of Judah. And that's foretold all the way back in Genesis when uh, the, the different tribes are being blessed and Judah and Christ himself is present to be, uh, is said to be holding the scepter and ruling the people. So if Christ is supposed to be from Judah, not Levi, how is it that we have him as a priest? For Christ to serve as a priest, he could not do so under the law as a Levitical priest, right? He would have been killed, as we just said. He could not do so, and since perfection cannot be attained by the law and the sacrifices, the blood of bulls and goats, when we have to have something better, something different come along, someone who is from another order of priests, who comes from the same order as Melchizedek, who is greater and superior than Abraham. And this priest that we have, he's going to come forward and he's going to offer a right sacrifice that will give us the perfection that we need, that will give us the salvation we need for God's people. So then in verse 15, we continue this argument about how we need to have a better priest. So in 15, it says, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, that is Christ, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we have this need because of the, the limited nature of the law, because you and I are not able to obtain perfection in the law, we need a better covenant and a better priest that can give us the thing that we need. Because the sacrificial system, the priesthood, all of it was set up because of our sin separated us from God. Because of our sin, none of us are able to draw near to God without severe punishment, without severe ramifications. God is infinitely holy, and we are completely just wrecked, sinful creatures. And because of that, we are unable to draw near to God. Now, the priesthood was given so that uh, sacrifices could be offered, and there could be a light forgiveness of sins. But the sacrificial system kept going day after day, year after year. And as we'll see in, later on in Hebrews, the sacrifice, the blood of bulls and goats that was routinely offered was not really cutting it. We needed something greater. We needed something better. So we have Christ who steps forward in our place as our high priest, who stands as a mediator between us as sinful people and an infinitely holy God. And Christ, as this high priest, he can't offer the sacrifices under the Levitical law. It was limited and he couldn't do so legally. So he steps forward as one who is from the order of Melchizedek, one who is without uh, beginning of days or end of life. He has this priesthood that is indestructible and eternal because of who he is, and it is rooted in his resurrection. Because he has a resurrected body, he has an indestructible life. And in 17, it says, It is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Every other priest under the Levitical priesthood, it was limited to them because they would eventually die. But Christ does not have a limited priesthood. He doesn't only serve a term in office for only four years. He stands as a priest right now at this moment on our behalf. And that is incredibly important for us so that we recognize that we have this mediator, this one who stands on in our place for us, who is offering prayers, who is interceding on our behalf before the Father. In this promise that is witnessed of Christ in verse 17, this is a promise that is made way back when in Psalm 110. And in Psalm 110, we see that Christ is this priest who stands forever in the order of Melchizedek. And so this is a promise and an oath that is given that is separate from the law because the law will not give us the salvation that we need. Verse 18, for on one hand, the former commandment, the law of Moses, the Levitical priesthood, it is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, 
a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Verse 22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The Old Testament law, the Old Covenant, it has this weakness and this inability to save us. We know this very well. Because of our sinfulness, because of our weakness, the law is not able to do what, what it was originally designed to do. And so it was actually set aside because we could not obtain the forgiveness, we could not obtain the salvation that we need under that old sacrificial system. And so it was set aside and a better hope is introduced. Now there is a hope that is attached to the law. There's a hope that is attached to the covenant and to the sacrificial system. God made promises to the people of Israel that if they kept God's law, if they obeyed his precepts, if they followed the sacrifices well, then they would be blessed. And in Deuteronomy 28, we see these blessings and what they are. And if you read Deuteronomy 28, uh, specifically the first six or so verses, it talks about these blessings where it is uh, a blessing of children, blessings of crops, blessing of just multiplying herds and safety and security. The blessings of obedience were very physical in their nature. It was children, herds, crops, land, safety, and security. It's very earthly based. In fact, the blessings were in a lot of ways tied to the land itself. But they were still limited in its nature. But when we see that there is a better hope that is introduced because of Christ, there is a better covenant that is introduced because of Christ. We see that there is something that is better for us that can give us the thing that we need. We need to be able to draw near to God. We need to be able to be in communion with him, in fellowship with him. And through the sacrifice of Christ, through this new covenant, we have this ability to have forgiveness, salvation, and to be able to draw near to God. So under the weakness of the law, we have it being set aside, and it's based on our obedience that we have to be blessed. But in the death of Christ, this better hope and these better blessings are introduced. And under these better blessings, this is based on not our obedience, but on the obedience of Christ. Because if under the old covenant, we have to obey to get the blessings, under the new covenant, we are given the blessings that Christ himself gets from his obedience, which in and of itself is a massive new shift. And so if in Deuteronomy 28, we have these very physical blessings that are outlined, in Ephesians 1, we see these very spiritual blessings that are given to us in Christ. And so we have these spiritual blessings that are in Christ in all the heavenly realms, all spiritual blessings, all of these things are given to us in Christ under this new covenant. And it's once again, not because of our obedience, not because of our good works, not because of our ability to save ourselves or to do the things that are required of us, but because Christ was obedient. And in Christ's obedience, in Christ's sacrifice, we now have access to these blessings. And because of the oath that God made to Christ back in Psalm 110, we have this better covenant and this better guarantor of a better covenant. Because in some ways, the Levitical priests, in some measure, they were responsible for overseeing the guaranteeing of the covenant. They were responsible for doing the sacrifices the right way. They were responsible for making sure that they sacrificed this lamb under this uh, statute in this appropriate, appropriate manner. But oftentimes, the priest really didn't do a good job at leading God's people and following God's law. And Christ, as the better high priest, as the more obedient high priest, he guarantees our better covenant because of this oath and because of his sacrificial life. So then when we get to verses 23, uh, 23 and 25 of Hebrews 7, it says this. The former priests, there were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, that's Jesus, holds his priesthood 
permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. So we have this problem that we set up at the beginning of this sermon where we have this priesthood of Levi and we have this priesthood of Melchizedek and this really mysterious figure of Melchizedek and how he is pointing forward to the better priesthood of Christ. Christ stands permanently on our behalf, as we've said. He stands right at this very moment for us, interceding on our behalf, offering um, prayers to God and interceding for us. The Levitical priesthood was limited, as we've said, because of their weakness and because of death. They were fallible men. They were under the curse of sin. They were under the curse of death. They were subject to those curses in a lot of ways. But because of Christ, because of his obedience, because of his resurrection, he has this eternal priesthood. And in his eternal priesthood, he is able, Hebrews says, to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. His sacrifice is sufficient. His sacrifice is truly, really able to be saved, or to save us. And so we have this ultimate need where we need to be able to experience forgiveness. We need to experience salvation. We need to experience closeness with God. But because of our sin, we are simply unable to. We, in our own power, we cannot draw near to God. We, before, outside of Christ, we cannot approach God. There is certain punishment. There is certain death for that because our sin is too much and God's holiness is too holy for us to even bear the sight of it. And so we need someone to intercede for us, someone who mediates, someone who stands in the gap, as it were, who offers us a way to draw near to this holy and righteous God. We have this sacrificial system that is simply limited and unable to do what it is supposed to do. So we need this better covenant, this better priest, this better sacrifice to give us the thing that we need, true forgiveness and true salvation. And so Christ in his eternal priesthood stands and is able to save to the uttermost. And so then back where we started in verse 26, it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest who is holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. Since he did this once for all when he offered up himself, for the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. It is fitting and it is necessary for us that those who of us, those of us who want to draw near to God, who want to experience grace, want to experience forgiveness of sins, that we have this Christ as our high priest. We can draw near to God only by the sacrifice of Christ, only by the blood of Christ. He is holy. He is innocent. He is separated from sinners only in the sense that he himself is not sinful. And now we have no need to have a sacrificial system. We don't need to have sacrifices offered every single day to cleanse us of our sins. We have this once for all offered sacrifice of Christ. It is perfect and holy and complete and sufficient. And through this sacrifice, all other sacrifices, the entirety of the Levitical priesthood simply becomes obsolete, no longer needed, for God's people. Because Christ, as this high priest, he accomplished what no other priest under the law was able to do. He guarantees this better covenant for us. He offers himself as a sacrifice for us. He stands as our mediator on our behalf and intercedes for us at the uh, right hand of the Father right at this moment. Christ, as the high priest in every single facet of being a priest, is better than any other high priest that ever offered a sacrifice on behalf of God's people. And this is for our good, so that we have this opportunity to draw near to Christ, to draw near to God. 
In Hebrews 10, verses 4 and 5, it says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, He said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. We are in the middle of Advent. And as being in the middle of Advent, we are awaiting and preparing ourselves for Christ's first coming, for his, his birth as a small baby that we will celebrate at Christmas. But let's not the, forget the reason he came in the first place. His body was given to him to be a sacrifice for us. His life begins in the manger, but it leads inevitably to the cross where he died in our place. The blood of the God-man was shed to make forgiveness and was shed to make reconciliation between God and between man possible. Under the old covenant, we have, we have weakness, we have limitations. We couldn't draw near to God. Not fully, not really. We have no true forgiveness under the sacrificial system with blood and bull, a blood of bulls and goats. But under the new covenant, Christ himself offered himself on our behalf once for all. And this allows us to draw near to God with boldness. So as we heard, read earlier, we are to be preparing our hearts and preparing ourselves for Christ in his first coming and for his second coming. Let us remember that in this moment, we have a high priest who stands on our behalf. And if you have never experienced this forgiveness, if you have never recognized that Christ stands for you and he died for you in the place of sinners, today is a fantastic day to, to have that opened up to your eyes and opened up to your heart, that we have a high priest who stands interceding for us on our behalf. So let's, let's pray together now, and then we will respond. We will respond in song. Lord, Lord, you are, you are holy and you are mighty and you are righteous and you are magnificent. And we are finite, sinful creatures. And Lord, because of our sin, we are separated from you. We cannot get to you. We cannot draw near to you. We cannot be in fellowship with you. Your holiness is too much. Our sin and our wretchedness cannot stand before your holiness and your might and your righteousness. So Lord, as we are in such a need because of our sin, you have prepared a body for Christ who lived a perfectly obedient life to you, who died a horrendous death, but one of sacrifice, one that was offered to you on our behalf. Lord, the blood of bulls and goats cannot save us, cannot give us forgiveness of sins, but because of the shed blood of Christ, we now have a way to draw near to you. And so, Lord, help us to be reminded of why we need such a high priest and how it is indeed fitting that you stand in our place for us on our behalf. And, Lord, if there is someone here who has never tasted and seen that you are good, who has never recognized their own sin and their own separation from you and their own need, to stand in the sacrifice of Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would, you would wake them up to that reality and that need today, that you would convict them of their sins and that you would draw them to you by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to be strengthened in our knowledge and in our affection for this, this high priest who loves us and who, who sacrificed himself for us. And help us as we are in the middle of this Advent season to prepare our hearts to celebrate you and to celebrate this sacrifice that you came to offer for us. Lord, it is in your name that we pray. Amen.